Warning, this show may contain biased opinions regarding the Southeastern Conference, and in particular, the University of Florida. College football fans that don't meet these criteria are cautioned, for this program may show outrageous and extreme takes. Welcome, everybody, to a new show that I'm calling This Day in College Football History. Every Friday, I will be diving into a college football team for the entire 2021 season and looking at past events from their history that occurred on those specific dates. This season, I'm covering my favorite team, the Florida Gators. I will not always cover huge events. I will be looking back at the specific games or situations that I found interesting and have also occurred on the same date I released the video. As a huge football fan who doesn't always know a lot about the history of Florida football before I was born, I'm excited to dive into this show. Hut, hut, hike! This week, I will be discussing the 1983 Florida Gators in their first game of that season, which was played on September 3rd against the Miami Hurricanes. This game was famous for being the Hurricanes' only loss in their first ever national championship season. The Florida Gators at that time were coming off of an 8-4 record a year prior after a disappointing loss to Arkansas in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. The Razorbacks, coached by Lou Holtz, beat the Gators 28-24 after trailing 17-7 at halftime. Arkansas finished that season ranked 8th in the nation and had one of the top defenses in the country. They even tied the famous 1982 SMU team that won a national championship that season. After a tough season in 82, the Gators reloaded with what fans hoped to be Florida's first SEC championship winning team, coached by Charlie Pell in his fifth season as head coach. The offense was led by senior quarterback Wayne Peace, who had just broken the NCAA single season completion percentage record at 70.7%. And though they were losing fullback James Jones, he would soon be replaced by a three-headed monster at fullback with future pros Neil Anderson, John L. Williams, and Lorenzo Hampton. And coaching this offense would be a young Mike Shanahan who would later go on to be a prolific NFL head coach. The defense looked even nastier, led by an All-American linebacker, Wilbur Marshall, who seemed to be one of the most feared men in college football at the time. If you aren't sure of who he is, just take a look up there at the Ring of Honor at the Swamp. Florida looked to be a top contender, trying to compete for their first SEC championship victory, but they would soon be facing one of the toughest schedules in college football that season, along with an offseason that was riddled with complications. During that spring, there had been a growing concern that Coach Pell would be leaving the Gators to go coach elsewhere. It made complete sense, seeing that he had just left the great Clemson team a few years prior after rumors of recruiting violations started popping up. People even speculated on who would take Pell's place, with one newspaper saying that ex-Gator quarterback Steve Spurrier could potentially be a candidate. Heh, <laughs> yeah right, like that would ever work, you idiots. The rumors were bad enough to anger Charlie Pell, with him saying something that probably still holds true today about most Gator fans and basically any hardcore sports fan out there. Quote, This is exactly what's wrong with Florida football. Now, I have to talk to the media for two weeks about this and not have time to coach at spring practice. I'll just be mending fences. End quote. Rumors started to die down as the offseason continued, but not after a newer and potentially more harmful rumor arose. After his Clemson team was accused of recruiting allegations, Coach Pell decided to have the Florida Athletic Department investigate his own program at the end of 1982. By February of 83, the St. Petersburg Times reported that Florida had been scalping hundreds of thousands of dollars in complimentary tickets given to the players as a way to compensate them for more than what they got for their scholarship. There were also reports of players being given cupcake classes in order to boost their poor grades, which I'm not really sure why that's even something that's newsworthy, since everyone I know at UF, myself included, took classes like history of jazz and bugs and people in order to boost their grade. Regardless, Coach Pell now had an even bigger headache to prepare for into this particular season. An article from April 16th in the Miami Herald stated that at that point, 11 teams had already been placed on probation under similar circumstances. In June, it had been discovered that senior quarterback Wayne Peace 
had suffered a herniated disc injury while playing basketball. He had noticed leg and back pain, and once his legs started to become numb, he got it checked out. This had the Gators and their fans extremely worried, because at the time, it usually took a patient around six months to recover from this type of injury, with an athlete possibly never playing again. Luckily for Peace, the team's neurosurgeons had discovered a newer type of surgery which could get him back on the field in time for the season opener through a surgery called percutaneous disectomy. The surgeons could remove the disc through a small tube rather than by the cutting and moving of muscle, bone, and nerve roots which traditionally occurred in the past. Peace went into surgery on July 1st and was able to stand and walk by the next day and could begin rehabilitation after two weeks of rest. By August 3rd, he was ready to take the field. On July 1st, Wayne Peace checked into Shams Hospital on the University of Florida campus. The Gators' opening game was only two months away. A team of physicians led by Dr. Friedman took only 15 minutes to perform the percutaneous discectomy. Wayne came down to the operating room about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, he was placed under general anesthesia, positioned on his side, and then prepped and draped for surgery. The operation involves making a one-inch incision over the hip. Using x-ray guidance, a small plastic tube is then positioned at the side of the herniated disc. Special instruments are then inserted down the plastic tube, and the disc is removed in a piecemeal fashion. The advantage of this procedure is, is that it's done through this small tube, and as a consequence, there is no trauma to muscle, bone or nerve roots as it always happens in the traditional forms of back surgery. I was excited about it. I got out uh, the day after the surgery and uh, matter of fact the night, that night about 11 o'clock one of the nurses came in and she said would you like to get up and walk now and uh, I was scared. I said you know can I walk now and she said yeah come on we'll go take a walk and uh, it was very slow but I was up and walking and moving around and uh, from that point on I knew that I would have the chance to play. As far as most people were concerned, the 1983 season was going to be a rebuilding year for the University of Miami. Head coach Howard Schnellenberger was in his fifth year as head coach for the Canes. He had just lost both Jim Kelly and Mark Rick at quarterback. Yeah, it's the same Jim Kelly and Mark Rick you're thinking of. This meant that they would have to be naming a new starting quarterback for this season. Going into the Florida game, many of the Miami players were either listed as injured or doubtful to play in week one. Schnellenberger was quoted going into the season saying, this is the worst series of preseason injuries since I've been here. End quote. They were going to have 11 freshmen dressing out for game one to help assist with injuries. This usually didn't happen during this time period. Basically, the only position that didn't have injuries present were the tight ends and kickers. Every other position was having issues and scrambling players around, trying to put a team together before opening day. Coach Schnellenberger ended up picking redshirt freshman Bernie Kozar as a starting quarterback. There's a great quote from the Miami Herald during this time by one of Miami's quarterbacks, Vinny Testaverde, when he said, quote, I'm not going to be sitting behind anyone. I'm not going to be a Mark Rick. End quote. Dang, throwing Georgia shade already. Even though he did end up sitting, it worked out in his favor. After Kozar left Miami, Testaverde ended up winning a Heisman Trophy in 1986. So, Kozar would be starting over a future Heisman winner and a player who had already played three games a season before in Kyle Vanderweeden. Their offense also featured some very talented fullbacks with seniors Albert Bentley, Speedy Neal, and Keith Griffin, as well as Daryl Oliver and Alonzo Highsmith. But with the brand new QB, four starting offensive linemen, and a bunch of young receivers, it looked like it was going to be a rough opener for the Hurricanes. At the time, Florida and Miami had been playing annually since 1938, except for 1944 because of War World II. This had already turned into a classic rivalry game. The Gators led the series 23 to 21, and were looking for their 400th program win to come against the Hurricanes. This series already had some moments to build up a rivalry. In 1971, while Florida was leading 45 to eight late in the fourth quarter, the defense laid on the ground and let Miami score so that Florida's quarterback, John Reeves, could get the ball back and break the NCAA all-time passing record. The stunt was named the Gator Flop, and Miami's coach, Fran Kersey, at the time refused to shake hands with Florida's coach, Doug Dickey. Kersey ended up saying after the game, quote, it was the worst thing I've ever seen in football, end quote. Yeah, 
letting a player accomplish a massive goal at the time is the worst thing you've ever seen in college football. Okay, they even let your team score more points. But moving on. As the Florida team celebrated by taking a dip in the Orange Bowl fountain, Miami's coach Fran Kersey was saying that Gator coach Doug Dickey would live to regret the day he pulled such a Bush League stunt on the Canes. Well, let me say it this way to you. There were several angles to this ball game. Number one is that our football team came to play and they wanted to win the game very badly. This was a game we thought we would remember over the winter. And uh, so we came to play and played very well to start the ball game and uh, made some things happen. It turned out to half that John Reeves had 170 yards passing at the half. And we felt this made us within striking range of an all-time record in collegiate passing. Uh, those are unusual records. In 1975, the Hurricanes were up 11 to eight when they punted the ball to Florida's Henry Davis. They thought Davis's knee touched the ground when he caught the punt, but the refs ruled that the ball was still live and he ran for a 63 yard game winning touchdown. In 1980, Gator fans threw tangerines at the Miami coaches and players, celebrating Florida's tangerine bowl bid. In retaliation, Schnellenberger had their kicker kick a field goal at the end of the game to make their lead even larger at 31-7. In 1981, Miami drove down the field down by two points and iced the game when kicker Danny Miller made a 55-yard field goal. In 1982, a controversial catch made by Florida's fullback James Jones was the winning touchdown for the Gators in a 17-14 victory. The Gators also weren't the biggest fans of playing Miami every season with an already difficult SEC schedule. When talked about the likelihood of the series continuing to be played annually, legendary Miami coach and AD Andy Gustafsson reported, quote, Miami needs Florida on its schedule, but Florida would like hardly anything more than not having to play Miami. Beating UM does little for UF except temporarily remove some exasperation. Beating Florida translates into desperately needed additional customers for Miami. UF is country, UM is city. The differences never end. The Gators are old oak and the Hurricanes young palms. End quote. It might be biased, but I still think this holds true today. You can prove me wrong in the comments. On game day, the Gators had a record high 73,907 fans in attendance while they showed off their new luxury skyboxes. An article from the Orlando Centennial stated that for the small price of $30,000, you can watch the games just like you do at home. They have a TV, air conditioning, and eight swivel chairs. Just for reference, $30,000 in 1983 comes out to around $80,000 today in 2021. The opening kickoff and drive for Miami was a sure sign of how the rest of the game would go. Albert Bentley fumbled the opening kickoff, but decided to try and return the kick regardless. He was stopped within their own seven yard line. Then they were called for a delay of game penalty. Fullback Speedy Neal fumbled the ball on a screen pass that was recovered by Gator linebacker Patrick Miller on the 13 yard line. The Gators ended up scoring three plays later from a six yard pass from Wayne Peace to fullback Joe Henderson to go up seven to zero. Then on their second drive, Miami's punter Rick Tootin, which apparently one of the sportcasters that day called Bootin Tootin, kicked a 23 yard punt, which only made it to the Gators 29 yard line. Florida then drove down the field to make the game 13 to zero after Florida missed their extra point. This drive included a lateral pass from Wayne Peace to receiver Dwayne Dixon, who then threw a 28 yard pass to receiver B Lang. Joe Henderson then caught his second touchdown pass from Peace. Halfway through the second quarter, Kozar and the Hurricanes had driven all the way down to the Gators 27 yard line, where he threw his first interception of the game. Then to end the first half, Miami's kicker, Jeff Davis, missed a 41 yard field goal to get them on the board. Miami then stopped the Gators on their first series in the second half, only to have the punt returner, Eddie Brown, fumble the punt return and give the ball back to Florida. Shortly after, Florida's long range kicker, Chris Perkins, made a 53 yard field goal to go up 16 to zero. Yeah, that's right. Florida had two different kickers they used during the games. One for short yardage situations and Bobby Raymond and a long range kicker in Chris Perkins. Later on in the third quarter, Neil Anderson scores on a nine yard touchdown run, increasing the lead to 22 to zero. Florida failed on a two point conversion later on. Freshman running back Alonzo Highsmith ended up fumbling the following kick return, giving the ball back to the Gators. Four plays later, Florida's other kicker, Bobby Raymond, made a 34-yard field goal, making the score 
25 to zero. Later in the game, freshman Daryl Oliver for Miami fumbled and UF recovered at the 37 yard line. Five plays later, Raymond hit another field goal, this time at 41 yards, with the score now 28 to zero. Late in the game, Florida's backup quarterback Dale Dormany threw an interception to Miami's Jack Fernandez, setting up a redemption field goal for kicker Jeff Davis. He made a 41 yard field goal to avoid the goose egg and the Gators ended up manhandling the Hurricanes at home 28 to three. The All-American, Wilbur Marshall, had a bruised foot that forced him out of the game midway through the second quarter, but he was able to come back in the third quarter and restore what Gator fans called Marshall Law, making five tackles and a sack. Bernie Kozar finished the day throwing three interceptions to Florida's Bruce Vaughn, Tony Lilly, and Vito McKeevy. Even with all of the turnovers, he still managed to throw 24 for 45 and 223 yards. Wayne Peace had only gone 18 for 32 with 146 yards and two touchdowns, which is still better numbers than a must-champ quarterback would have put up. This was a classic game where an already sharpened veteran team had their way with a team who was young, injured, and trying to figure out their identity. At the end of the day, the Gators only outgained Miami in yards, 311 to 298. But it's almost impossible to keep up when your team commits seven turnovers and the other team commits zero. After the loss, one of Miami's more vocal players, Albert Bentley, stood to the sideline and pointed to the scoreboard. He said, quote, you see that yardage? We beat ourselves, we beat ourselves, we beat ourselves. End quote. Uh, you think? In the locker room after the game, Coach Pell said, quote, I know that Coach Schnellenberger on Thursday said that turnovers and big plays would be the difference in the game. I believe that's what happened tonight. End quote. I mean, after that kind of comment and going for two while up by 22 points, I'm sure Coach Pell was liked by opposing teams everywhere. Last interesting fact I'd like to throw in there about the game is how an ex-Marine named Steve Kirtley, who was a walk-on for the Florida Gators, dressed out for the game. He was a guard who was part of an Iranian hostage situation in 1979 when the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran had been raided. He was held captive from November 1979 until January of 1981. Kirtley stated, quote, I was asleep during the takeover of the embassy because I had been on watch the night before. They blindfolded us, tied us up, and put us in a room. From November to December, no one was allowed to talk. I wasn't mistreated, but for 14 and a half months, I was locked up, and I got outside an average of once a month for an hour. End quote. As we all know, after this game, Miami went on to become a team of destiny, going undefeated for the rest of the season and upsetting the top-ranked Nebraska Cornhuskers to win the 1983 national title. They became the Miami that dominated all throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. The Gators went on to finish their season 9-2-1, beating Iowa in the Gator Bowl. They lost to both Georgia and Auburn, making them unable to win the SEC championship that they were building up for. 1983 was the first season that the Gators have ever finished within the top 10 of the AP poll. Because of the violations committed under his tenure, Pell ended up leaving three games into the 1984 season. This eventually led to Florida being placed on probation and left trying to recover for the remainder of the 80s. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to comment, share, and subscribe. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter in the links below. Please make sure to let me know of more topics you'd like me to dive into.